My name is David Law. I am an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, but uh, of uh, particular interest recently, I'm also a member of the James Webb Mid-Infrared Science Team, the MIRI team, the uh, mid-infrared instrument that gets both imaging and spectroscopy out beyond five microns on JWST. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on with JWST development over the last few years and some of the exciting science I'm interested in doing with it in the longer term. So JWST, as many of you know, is NASA's newest flagship uh, observatory that's now really a successor in many ways to the Hubble Space Telescope in the sense that it draws a lot of legacy from uh, now what Hubble's been doing for the last 30 years or so. And it really builds upon that legacy to allow us to do things that you know, really just haven't been possible up to now in many different ways. Uh, by no means is it taking over from Hubble entirely though. Happily, Hubble is still you know, working along well and we hope it will continue to be with us for many years. And we're very excited to be running two telescopes at the same time so we can use them together to learn even more about the universe than we could individually. But as far as what we're interested in doing with JWST, it really covers life of the universe and everything, if you will. In a sense, we'd like to learn about you know, the very earliest times in the history of the universe, all the way up to you know, what makes us who we are today. If we're looking back towards the end of the so-called cosmic dark ages, the period at which you now the universe was opaque and light really couldn't travel through it, we want to see the very first stars turning on in the universe that are ionizing the universe and allowing that light to stream freely for billions of years until we can measure it. We want to find those first stars and first galaxies. We want to look at those early galaxies as they form and grow from you know, irregular little blobby lumps of star formation into the you know, beautiful spiral and elliptical type galaxy structures we see today. We'd like to try to understand the birth of stars and planets in those galaxies as well, how we got solar systems and planetary systems like our own. And ultimately, by looking at the atmospheres of planets around other stars, we'd like to try and understand what those planets are like and could any of them possibly harbor things that resemble our own solar system and ultimately could any of them harbor life like we get on our own planet or even some other kinds entirely. So the real motivation behind the telescope is to answer questions you know, across the entirety of the universe and of time. So what I'd like to do today to give you an idea of where I'm going to be going for the next uh, now 45 minutes or so, is I'll start by asking why we're interested in building JWST to begin with. What is it that JWST gives us that we can't get with current telescopes today, such as Hubble, Spitzer, and a number of others that came before? I'll turn from that to telling you more about what JWST itself is, how the telescope was designed and built, and what some of its capabilities are. And then pivot from that to telling you about some of the exciting science that we're planning on doing with the telescope, even in the first year or two of operations. Now, wrap up with just a couple notes on where JWST is now, both in a physical sense and also in a development sense, because this is a very active time in the life of the telescope during commissioning, and give you an idea of some of the things to look for in the coming months as JWST continues to uh, be brought online. So, Starting out with why we're interested in looking at JWST itself, there's really three answers to those questions of what JWST brings to the table that we really haven't been able to do as well as we'd like before. Those three things are, it looks in the infrared, so at much longer wavelengths than we're used to. It uses spectroscopy and really makes that a, a workhorse of the science that the telescope itself is doing. And the third one is it's in space, and that provides a number of key benefits that you really just can't get from the ground and you know, really drives some of the things that this telescope uniquely can do. So starting with infrared light. Now, what is infrared light and you know, why is it we're particularly interested in studying with that? So you're probably already familiar with the you know, overall electromagnetic spectrum. So the range of light at different wavelengths and frequencies ranging from gamma rays and X-rays at you know, very, very short wavelengths, you know, well past the blue and the violet, all the way up to radio waves at very long wavelengths after you've gone through the visible, the infrared, the microwave, you finally get to the radio. The Hubble Space Telescope that we've been using for now the last 30 years or so is really optimized to work in this range, the visible light range here, which is from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers or so. It's got a little bit of capability beyond that. We can do some exciting UV science with Hubble that we're really trying to make the most of at the moment. And you can go a little ways into the infrared as well, out to about now 1500 nanometers or something like that. So that's a little ways into the infrared. 
JWST really has a shared heritage, partly from the Hubble Space Telescope and also from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was a, a smaller mission that uh, orbited for about 20 years or so. And that was an infrared telescope designed to work you know, significantly at longer wavelengths than Hubble all the way out to 100 microns or so. However, it was also very small and didn't have nearly the capability of Hubble. JWST is really a fusion between the two. It covers the kinds of wavelengths we were able to access with Spitzer, but are the kinds of image quality that we were able to get with Hubble at those wavelengths. And the reason why we're interested in light at these wavelengths is because it tells us things that we really just can't get from the optical light at all. It tells us particularly about the warm universe, the dusty universe, the distant universe and what's going on with molecules in the universe. So going beyond what you can learn just by looking at individual atoms and learning about the chemical structures of particularly planets and gas clouds within the universe. So to give you a couple examples of why that matters, I can show you an image like this one, which is bring things back to you know what we're familiar with nearby and posing a couple of questions that you just cannot answer if you're looking at optical light alone, like you can see with your eyes. I could ask you two questions from this picture. I could ask you a question for the picture on the left, you know, which cup contains the hot drink? If I told you that one of them had boiling water in it and the other one had ice water in it, which one's which? You can't tell just by looking at it with the information that you get with your eyes alone. Similarly, if I showed you this picture on the right over here and ask, I asked you, you know, how many fingers is this astronomer holding up? You'd say, there's no way to know. The fingers are hidden. They're behind a bag and you can't possibly see you know, how many fingers he's holding up underneath that bag. These are a couple of questions that you, know, you cannot answer with visible light alone. But if you go to the infrared, the answer becomes easy. If I asked you which cup is hot, you say this one on the left, you can see it visibly glowing with the heat radiation, the infrared radiation coming from that you know, very warm drink. For the picture on the right, it also becomes easy. You can actually see the fingers that he has extended underneath the bag. The reason why is because you know, people themselves are warm. They glow and give off infrared radiation too. And infrared radiation can penetrate through some things that are thick to optical radiation. In this case, the bag, you can see right through that at infrared wavelengths. It's the exact same kind of thing for you know, astrophysical questions as well. So I'm showing you here a number of pictures of the uh, so-called Pillars of Creation, one of the famous Hubble images, in three different wavelengths of light. In this one on the left, I'm showing you a picture of the Pillars of Creation from visible light, so the usual blue, green, red type light that you're familiar with from Hubble. And you can see these now giant dust clouds of the Pillars of Creation. The surrounding regions of very active star formation where young stars are you know, forming and turning on for the very first time. You can't actually see that. All you see is this dust, which is dark and just blocking the light behind it. This is exactly like the picture we were just looking at with the black plastic bag covering the thing that you're interested in seeing. You cannot see through it optical wavelengths. If you go out to the near infrared, this is an image from the near infrared now taken at the very extreme end of Hubble's wavelength range that it can observe. You can actually start to see through that dust, just like we were able to see through the bag earlier. Now you don't get your light blocked by the dust. You can see down to the individual star forming regions. You can see those young stars forming. In some cases, you can even see straight through the cloud entirely and see what lies in the universe beyond it. If you go to even longer wavelengths out to the so-called thermal infrared, then you can see a different view, where now you can actually see the dust itself glowing. The dust has some temperature too, it gives off radiation as well. And you can study the properties of the dust by virtue of you know, how it glows. This picture on the right is taken with Spitzer, and you can see how it's really not the same kind of quality as you get from the Hubble pictures on the left. Due to two things. Now, one is it's longer wavelength, and so that means the resolution isn't going to be quite as good. It was also taken with a much smaller telescope as well, because we don't have anything you know, that was able to take uh, you know, pictures of this quality this far into the infrared until now. That's one of the things we'd like to do with JWST, is fill in this kind of information that we get from these two pictures at this kind of image quality and use that to learn about processes in the universe we just haven't been able to see well before. Another reason that we care about the infrared is because as light travels, it actually stretches as it's going through the universe. So if you're looking at you know, something that's you now very far back in the universe, if you're looking at the very earliest galaxies or the very first stars that are turning on and early times after the Big Bang, 
that light starts off now at very short wavelengths. It might be blue light that you want to study from these things if you want to study, say, some of the hydrogen lines, blue or red light. But as that light travels to us across the course of billions of years through the universe, the wavelength of that light actually stretches out and the photons you know, change from being you know, blue or red light to infrared light. They get longer and longer wavelength the further and further away the object that you're looking at is. So what that means is that even if you are most interested in the processes that produce blue or red or green light in galaxies, you have to end up looking at the infrared to see that anyway if you want to look at something that's very far away. To illustrate kind of what that looks like, here's a quick plot showing you a a loose uh, idea of a spectrum of some object that you might see in the very distant universe. So this line here, this jagged line, is a conceptual representation of what you might get for a spectrum of an object at what's called a redshift of five. So this is when the universe is about a billion or so years old. We're looking back in time when we see this object. If you wanted to study these features here in that spectrum, you'd have to look in the optical around you know, 0.6 microns, in this case, 0.6 to 0.8 microns. All of these bumps down here are showing you various different filter curves. So this would be a you know, red type filter here you're looking at. This is a you know, early infrared filter here and going further out into the infrared as we go to the right on that plot. If you want to study that exact same object, but a little bit further away, now it's going to look like that. That entire spectrum is shifted to the right. So if you want to study these lines, you now need to be looking at 1.3 microns instead of 0.6 microns. If you want to look back even further, so now to a redshift of 20, super early after the time of the Big Bang, only 200 million years into the age of the universe, you're now looking all the way over here around two microns or so in order to just get the same light that you were getting earlier from a lot uh, closer to the blue. So even if you're not interested in infrared lines for their own purposes, you still need to be able to look at the infrared just to study very distant things. Changing tack a little bit, I'll ask why we're most interested in talking about spectroscopy from galaxies. Now, what that really teaches us. One of Hubble's main workhorses that's been doing for the last 30 years or so has been imaging. Hubble's been fantastic at getting multicolor imaging of a wide variety of astrophysical spectra. We've learned a lot from that. But fundamentally, there ends up being a limit in what you can learn from imaging. You want to get what's called spectroscopy, which is what tells us about the actual physics of the atoms and molecules in the universe and enables you to look at a star field like this one with blue stars and red stars and be able to tell us things about it. We can say this red star is a type M giant and it's such and such years old and it has lots of carbon in the atmosphere. Or this blue star here, now maybe that's a uh, O-type star that's particularly nearby and you now it's weird because it's got such and such a thing in its atmosphere. We can actually distinguish between all of these stars using spectroscopy and learn about what makes them tick. So the basic idea is this, if you're looking at anything in the universe that's hot, it gives off emission. So stars have some characteristic temperature. Now the atmosphere around us has a characteristic temperature. Everything that has heat gives off radiation. And the basic form of that radiation is something called the Planck function. It's a characteristic function that describes how much radiation a hot object puts off at each different wavelength. And it rises steeply in the blue, it peaks at some wavelength, and then it falls off slowly as it goes further into the uh, red and the infrared. If you're looking at a very blue star, those tend to be very young and hot stars. They put out more of their radiation in the blue, they tail off to the red, and because it puts out more blue light than red light, it looks blue to your eye. It's a little more complicated than that, involves how your eye responds to light as well, but that, that's most of the answer there. If you're looking at red stars, then now they put out most of their radiation here in the red. They're often a bit fainter, no, not always. And now, so you're seeing more red light from that star because there isn't as much blue light emitted by that radiation. But this is sort of the underlying spectrum that you get whenever you look at anything that you know, has some temperature to it. Atoms make that more interesting though. As you know, things like the hydrogen atom and other atoms have what are called quantized energy levels. The electrons in these atoms can't take just you know, any arbitrary energy they want. They're you know, discretized into certain different levels. And as you move an electron around between those energy levels that can either absorb or emit radiation at very characteristic frequencies and wavelengths corresponding to which of these atomic energy levels you moved the electrons between. 
What that means is when you look at the spectrum of some object, you see these very characteristic lines in the spectrum according to you know, what atoms are present in the uh, gas or you know, object that you're looking at. You can see emission lines from hydrogen, for instance, in this top example here, there's some very characteristic lines, which you know, astronomers get to learn the wavelengths of these lines by heart because we use them so much. So this, for instance, is the uh, 6563 hydrogen transition, which is now a strong red feature. There's a number of blue features that go along with it as well, and more going along into the ultraviolet. Depending on how you look at the object, whether or not you're seeing it you know, either emitting towards you or blocking light from behind it, you might see light either in emission or an absorption blocking the light from that background star. And each element in the periodic table has its own unique spectral fingerprint of lines that it'll imprint onto the spectrum. And you can use that to tell you about what you know, atoms are present in any given object you're looking at. The hydrogen atom, as I mentioned, for instance, has this very strong characteristic red line, the so-called hydrogen alpha line. Oxygen is another famous one that we see in a lot of you know, nearby nebulae. It's got a couple of very strong lines in the green that uh, we use for a lot of science that we're doing as well. And all of these other lines have characteristic uh, you know, features that we get used to recognizing as well. What that means is when you're looking at a star field like this one, instead of just being presented with blue stars and red stars, you can get spectra of all of these stars and say, here's a blue star on the top. In this case, it's an O-type star. It's got you now these characteristic absorption features due to hydrogen lines. Here's a red star on the bottom. And in this case, it's got you now most of its power coming out from the red and you can start seeing a lot of molecular bands in these kinds of things, titanium oxide type features and uh, some of the you know, very lowest temperature stars, for instance. And using these lines, you can learn about a lot about what's going on in an object, whether it be a star or a galaxy or a nebula or whatever it is you're interested in studying. Based on what lines are present, you can learn about the chemical composition of the object, you know, what atoms are present and what kind of quantities in the object. And learn about any magnetic fields, what the temperature and density of the gas is, etc. You can look at exactly where these lines are and exactly how they're shifted and say something about how the object is moving, because any movements in the gas is going to cause a Doppler shift. In small scales, this will tell you about a you know, few tens or hundreds of kilometers a second rotations in galaxies. So when we say that we know a galaxy is rotating, it's because we measure one of these lines, we see how much it shifted, and we can you know, deduce exactly from that how fast the galaxy is rotating in different locations. And this is actually how we know about the existence of dark matter. We see that galaxies are rotating faster than the amount of stuff that we see in there. There has to be some mass that we don't see based on how fast they're whipping around. It's also how we know about the expanding universe. As you go further and further away, lines are shifted more and more and more and more, telling us that you know, these objects are racing away from us faster and faster the further away you go. You can use the line width and strength to tell you about the amount of gas, the surface gravity, the pressure, and a wealth of other things as well. So, this is why we're really interested in optimizing spectroscopy that we can get out of JWST, just because it's what really tells you the physics of what's going on in the universe. And finally, the third part of the question, now why is it we're particularly interested in JWST? What does it give to us? Is space. So there's many telescopes on the ground, now many excellent telescopes that now I've used myself over many years but they're limited by three fundamental things that really drive a lot of the design considerations of Webb and other space telescopes. Namely, we have an atmosphere. Don't get me wrong, I, mean, I, I like the out atmosphere outside. I sincerely enjoy being able to breathe and you know, go outside and generally live my life on a planet that's able to support me. But if you're an astronomer, that atmosphere is very inconvenient sometimes in the sense that it's warm, it's turbulent, and it blocks a lot of the light that's trying to make it through the atmosphere that we'd like to study. On the turbulent side, because you now air bounces around, it blurs light from distant objects that we might be interested in looking at. For very distant objects, the light coming from them is effectively a plane wave. So it's a succession of waves coming towards us. And as that hits the atmosphere, it hits little pockets of air moving around in the atmosphere, and it gets bent, refracted in all sorts of different ways. So by the time it actually makes it all the way to the ground and the telescopes that we look at it with that we build outside, then it's actually warped in all sorts of interesting ways that make it very complicated to reconstruct into an image of the object itself that we're looking at. 
So you can have examples like this one, say, where if you've got a good what's called seeing day, where the atmosphere is very stable, you might be able to take an image of Jupiter from the ground that looks like this image on the left. And that's beautiful. You can see the cloud bands on Jupiter. You can see the great red spot. You can see substructure within those bands. It's great. But if you've got a bad day or a bad location on Earth, it's going to look like this on the right instead. It's a blurry mess. It's hard to really see anything at all. And it's not just that it can be better on one day and worse than on others. There's really a fundamental limit to even at the best sites on Earth, how good the atmosphere can be in terms of its turbulent, turbulence and how blurry an object looks. And it actually puts a limit on how big telescopes can be and still see finer details. Ordinarily, as you go to bigger and bigger telescopes, you get better and better angular resolution. You can see smaller and smaller details except you hit a limit with the atmosphere about the smallest details you can see, and you hit this limit fast. So the very biggest telescopes on Earth, you know, the 10 meter behemoths out in Hawaii, for instance, don't really have much better angular resolution than the six inch telescope I've got in my living room. Uh, you get limited by the atmosphere. And there's a couple of clever ways around this that people have been devising recently, using mirrors that you deform very quickly in such a way to exactly cancel out all the turbulence in the atmosphere. But even that can't be done perfectly. And space really gives a stability to the image that you really just can't achieve from the ground at all. And that allows you to push a lot of the measurements that you want to make to accuracies that can't be achieved from the ground. The second thing the atmosphere does is it blocks a lot of wavelengths even from getting to the ground at all. Now, in many ways, this is a good thing. I really appreciate being able to go for a walk outside and not be cooked by x-rays and gamma rays from the sun and various other sources. Now, for my personal health, that's a great thing. There's a little bit of UV that sneaks through so you can get sunburns, but most of the light that makes it through the atmosphere is in this optical window here. There's a little bit of UV, a little bit of infrared that gets through, and then this large swath through here of the you know, mid-infrared in particular that just gets blocked off from ever even making it to the ground. There's another window here in the radio, which is why you see radio telescopes being built on the ground as well. That light actually makes it through to the ground and you can study it. But if you're interested in studying, say, light at around 20 microns or something, there's not really much hope of seeing that from the ground because the light never even makes it there. Even for the light that does make it down, as I said, there's some infrared wavelengths that do make it to the ground. It doesn't turn out to be terribly useful in many regards in the sense that it's bright. You remember I mentioned that anything that's warm and has temperature glows, the atmosphere is warm and it glows in the infrared. Worse, your telescope is warm as well. Your telescope is sitting out in the air, so it is also glowing. So that means that even at the wavelengths that make it to the ground, what you're left with when you're trying to observe in the infrared from the ground is something like this. You're trying to observe some super faint astronomical candle in the middle of a blast furnace of light being radiated by the atmosphere and everything else around. So one of the best descriptions of this I've heard is from an astronomer called George Rieke, who compares doing infrared astronomy from the ground is kind of like trying to observe a star in daylight using a telescope made out of light bulbs. Yes, you can do it, but it really isn't anywhere near as good as if you can get up in space and above the heat and get your telescope cold and look at this instead, where now you can see the light of your candle flame against a blackness of the universe around it. That's ideally what you want to do. So if you put all of those things together, that's why we're really interested in building web, so that we can look at the infrared wavelengths that contain light that we can't see with Hubble and other telescopes. We're interested in something that focuses on spectroscopy to get at the physics, and we need to put it in space so that we can see very fine details and actually see those infrared wavelengths at all. So I'll turn quickly to talk about what actually JWST is now. And there's something that you know, many of you are probably already somewhat familiar with various different parts of it. Web itself is a feat of engineering 30 years in the making. It's composed of 18 gold-coated beryllium mirror segments that all have to work together as a larger telescope. One of the lessons that we've learned from building Hubble and lots of other telescopes over the years is that past a point, building a monolithic single mirror is actually pretty hard. And you want to build telescopes in segmented pieces so that they can be made both more easily and so they can be made lighter as well. 
JWST is a very lightweight telescope for its size. And that's because of a lot of the engineering and design principles we've learned over the last 30 years, we've been able to fold into it. It's also designed to fold up so it can fit in the rocket. In this case, for instance, you can see the wings of the mirror folded back. You can see the secondary mirror folded up and a little bit behind the primary mirror itself. And it's got a five layer capped on aluminum sun shield, which we're seeing deployed here in this test image from the ground. And what that's designed to do is block the light from the sun once you're up in space so that we can achieve the cold temperatures that we need in order to be able to see those infrared wavelengths. The mirror itself is substantially larger than Hubble once we get all 18 of these segments working together. So where Hubble had a primary diameter of about two and a half meters or well, a bit bigger than your average person, JWST is going to be about six and a half meters across and has a much larger collecting area, it means that it's going to gather a lot more light into the telescope aperture. Compared to Spitzer, which was the you know, previous you know, ancestor which uh, JWST derives from in a lot of its infrared observations, it's substantially larger than the Spitzer primary, meaning it gathers a lot more light and it can see much smaller and finer details as well. Webb, as I mentioned, has to fold up. There's a lot of research and development over the last 20 odd years that's gone into figuring out how to actually launch Webb. You had to fold it up to fit within the rocket. And a lot of the excitement over this last month or so has been over you know, this process happening in reverse and unfolding everything, uh, this you know, origami construction that came out of that rocket. So after it launched from Earth, we needed to unfold the telescope uh, sunshield pallets. We needed to deploy the sunshield. We needed to rotate the mirrors out. We needed to put down the secondary. We needed to you know, fold forth other parts of the mirrors. It's been a very complex unfolding sequence that's you know, really driven a lot of engineering challenges and was certainly an exciting time over the last month or so, seeing this all like, deploying in real time. The overall idea behind how Webb is going to orbit and where it's going to be based in the solar system is it's going to live out at this point called L2. That's the second of five Lagrange points that are associated with you know, the Earth-Sun orbit in the solar system. The idea behind these points is the mathematically defined points, which in the rotating coordinate frame of you know, going around the Sun, it's possible for a spacecraft to orbit these locations as if there was something there. So JWST will be orbiting this point as if there was a mass, a planet or a moon or something there, even though there really isn't. And that's because the forces from all the different parts of the system, the sun, the earth, the moon, all combine to make this a semi-stable location for it to go in the solar system. Ordinarily, if it was a bit further out from earth, it would lag behind and get lost away from earth over time. But the extra gravity from earth keeps pulling it so that it keeps up with it. So it's actually going to go into an orbit around this point L2. And the reason why we want to put it there is because that allows the sun shield to block out the three big offenders in terms of the you know, stuff that might make it too hot. The sun is obviously the big one. You actually want to block the earth and the moon at the same time as well. And one of the best places in the solar system to put this that's still nearby enough for us to actually talk to is this second Lagrange point. Not actually at the point itself, otherwise you know, it will be blocked off in unpleasant ways, but in an orbit around that point where its sun shield can block all three of these big offenders and allow the telescope itself on the other side to be very, very cold. This is what the telescope itself actually looks like. Now, this is the golden primary mirror here. There's a secondary mirror support structure here. So light bounces off these mirrors, bounces off the secondary mirror, and then goes in through the structure in the center into the instrument package, which is located on the back of uh, the telescope here. The sun shield here is now five incredibly thin layers of essentially mylar film thick. And on the other side of that mylar is all the spacecraft part of the telescope. This is the stuff that actually does the flying. This is where the rockets are located. This is where the solar and uh, power array is located. This is where the antenna is located to communicate back to earth. And between the two, and it's not that far from one side of the sun shield to the other, you've got to maintain a 300 degrees Celsius temperature differential. On the hot side of this, what it effectively means is that it's about hot enough to be able to boil water very nearly. Whereas on the back side, it has to be cold enough to freeze nitrogen. And now there was a lot of challenges in order to make the telescope able to support that kind of a differential over so small of a distance. How it's operating when it's out at those, uh, that location. 
is that now, because it can never actually point down towards the sun, that would fry the telescope. And it can never actually point away from the sun either because again, the sun shield would be in the wrong position. It would fry the telescope again. That means if the sun's over here, Webb always has to kind of look up or down or around in a circle from side to side. So at any given time, Webb can observe sort of this torus, if you will, in the sky. But over the course of a year, as Webb and the Earth you know, orbit around the sun, it's going to sweep out gradually and define the entire part of the sky that you can look at. But it means there's certainly some parts of the sky that are easier to look at than others. In addition to being a technological uh, marvel, Webb is a large international collaboration and reflects the efforts of you know, many people at hundreds of different locations, particularly across North America and Europe. So it's led by NASA, of course, based in America, but with large contributions also from the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency in Europe as well. Of all these different locations, now I'm based at the Space Telescope Science Institute myself in Baltimore, Maryland, and our role in the project is kind of threefold. We host Web Science Operations Center, so that's where we actually now do things like uh, now we run the space telescope instruments. We you now help make sure the instruments are calibrated properly. We run the calls for proposals to determine you know, what exactly is going to be observed by the telescope and when. We store that data when it comes down to us. And most recently, and what's different than what we've done for Hubble in the past, is we actually host the Web Mission Operations Center as well, which has been an exciting place to be over the course of the last few weeks or so. And in that mission operations center, that's where we actually send the commands that you know, are necessary to tell JWST what to do. That's where we send the commands to say, unfold and deploy the sun shield. That's where we're going to be commanding the individual instruments from to slew to a certain part of the sky and observe individual science targets. And you know, that's certainly uh, well worth a visit if you find yourself in Baltimore anytime soon. We talk to the telescope using another large international network of uh, antennas. In this case, it's the Deep Space Network, which is using antennas spread all the way around the world so that we can talk to JWST at any given time of day that we want to. It doesn't matter whether or not Baltimore has a good line of sight, so long as any part of the world has a line of sight from the United States, from Europe, from Australia, we can talk to the telescope, send commands, and receive back the data from the telescope itself. Perhaps the most international part of the telescope, though, is the hardware. So the actual instruments on board are built by an enormous consortium of countries in you know, both the United States, Canada, and Europe. These are the four main instruments on web. There's three near-infrared instruments, the near-cam instrument, which is the near-infrared camera. It's the most analogous to Hubble, perhaps. Two near-infrared spectrographs, NeoSpec and NIRIS. I'll highlight NIRIS in particular. This is one of the major Canadian contributions to JWST. It's actually a dual purpose instrument. It's both a spectrograph and also the fine guidance sensor as well. So this is the instrument that allows Hubble to actually acquire an object on the sky and you know, keep it fixed at the right location during a science observation so that we can take the data that we need. And then the mid-infrared instrument, which is one that I'm involved in, this is the one that you know, looks out at longer wavelengths from five through 30 microns. Naturally, the sun shield doesn't keep this instrument cool enough. We need an active cryo cooler on that one because we need to get the temperatures down to about seven Kelvin so that we can see the objects that uh, we want to be able to see. They all live in the JWST focal plane. So if you were a photon coming in for a distant galaxy and you're heading towards the telescope and you hit the instrument package into the inside of the telescope, this is what you'd see in the focal plane. You'd see all of these instruments spread out, taking up different locations, and they're all actually active at the same time so that you can you know, easily just move the telescope to point which one of these you want your photon to come in at any given time. You've got the main infrared cameras here in the middle. You've got a couple of the spectrographs off here to the left and the bottom. The part that I work on the most, one of the integral field units with MIRI, is actually this teeny tiny little square all the way up off here to the side. But uh, there's actually a lot more science we can get out of that tiny field than you'd think just looking at the size of it. If anybody wants to know more about that particular part, I'm happy to talk about it later. What I'd like to do now is highlight, I can't highlight every single mode of the telescope and all of the science that it can do, all the different ways it can observe, is there's, depending on how you count, anywhere between 16 and 20 or so different kinds of observing. There's standard imaging, you put in various colored filters and you take pictures through those filters. The so-called coronagraphic imaging, where you want to take a picture of something very faint next to something very bright. 
And in order to do that, the rough idea is it's kind of like you hold your thumb up, hold your thumb up to the sky and block out the bright object so you can see faint objects right next to it, except do that a lot more carefully and actually inside the telescope. That's the idea behind coronography, block out the bright object, usually a star, so you can see faint planets nearby and a couple other things as well. What I'd like to highlight though is a few of the spectroscopic modes since these are really the you know, power workhorses of JWST that allow us to do entirely new things. In particular, three of these modes that you know, allow us to look at multiple objects at the same time. The first of these is wide field slitless spectroscopy. The idea behind this is if you want to look at a field and just say, give me a spectrum of everything that's in this field. I want to know what's there and get a rough idea. And you can put a prism into the you know, light path and take your image of the field and disperse everything in that field all at the same time. So you get a small little spectrum from everything. Upside of this is that gives you a spectrum of everything in your field of view at once. You don't need to be choosy and you can find exciting new things unexpectedly. The downside is you get a spectrum of everything at once and they're all on top of one another and overlapping and you can't actually get very high spectral resolution. You can't see very fine details, but you can find interesting things to follow up later very easily. Another kind of you know, multiplexing spectroscopy you can do is with uh, the NIRSPEC instrument using a so-called micro shutter array, where now the idea is you take your field of view, you put a grid of shutters over it, and you choose which one of these you want to open. You say, I want a spectrum of that, 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 and that. And you open these magnetically controlled shutters from those exact locations and get spectra of those dispersed on the detector. And it's still kind of complicated, like you can see down here, you've still got lots of spectra on the detector, but it's a lot more controlled. You can get much higher resolution spectroscopy of now, a small number of objects now instead of everything all at the same time. And kind of the third way that you can get you know, lots of spectra all at the same time is something called integral field spectroscopy. And this is really designed to give you lots of information in a very dense area on the sky. So there's one galaxy you're most interested in and you want a spectrum at every location in that galaxy. Then you can use this so-called integral field spectrograph. You can think of it almost like a camera, if you will, except instead of taking a picture of this object, it'll give you a spectrum everywhere throughout that object for you know, a long range of wavelengths. Now, all three of these are ways that allow us to use web to you know, really multiplex what we can do and see many things all at the same time. So I'm running a bit low on time. I'd like to talk now about some of what JWST will actually do over the first year or so of observations. I already mentioned the four main themes that are interested in hitting science all the way from the very earliest universe to planetary systems and the origins of life. A large part of what Webb will do is already known. We've chosen what the cycle one science of the uh, project is gonna be. So the first year or so of observations following commissioning. And that's gonna be almost 400 individual programs and a couple thousand or so in individual investigators around the world studying almost every area of planetary astrophysics and you know, regular astronomy as well. Webb's a spectroscopy machine, like I mentioned earlier, about 70% of the total program time is dedicated to spectroscopy. Imaging obviously still has you know, a lot of interesting things we can do with that as well. 30% of the time is imaging, but Webb is really a spectroscopy machine. A couple of the fundamentals we can do with Webb, one of the things that we're getting into you know, very early on is trying to understand the you know, fundamental expansion of the universe itself. One of the interesting things to come out of work in recent years is that there's a tension in the so-called Hubble constant, a measurement of how fast the universe is expanding at any given point in time. We've got a lot, got a lot of different ways we can measure this. What we're finding is we're actually getting different answers from different ways of measuring it. Some of the ways we measure it tells us about 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and others tell us it's more like 73 or 74. And they sound like they're pretty close to one another, but the error bars on these measurements are getting sufficiently small that the disagreement is now very interesting. It's telling us that there's something fundamental about physics in the expanding universe that we don't understand yet. JWST is going to be working to help calibrate this difference and tell us what it is about the universe that we don't understand in terms of the very basic inflation properties. We'd like to discover the first galaxies. I mentioned earlier how when the first galaxies formed, then they were in a universe that was opaque, light couldn't travel through them very easily. And as those stars formed, they ionized the universe and allowed those photons to stream freely to large distances and across the universe. 
we'd like to see those very first stars as they're turning on. We'd like to be able to you know, figure out you know, at what redshift, when in the history of the universe did this occur? You know, can we actually see those first galaxies? We've used Hubble to find a few things that might be some of the first galaxies, but it's very hard to tell. We've got pictures of them, but we really need spectra. And for the spectra, we really need JWST. We'd like to understand how galaxies evolve and grow with time. Back in the very earliest parts of time, galaxies were really small, nubby, hard to define the structure. They evolve over time to turn into spiral galaxies like we're familiar with today. But we don't know exactly how that transformation occurs, when they start getting some of the structures that we're familiar with today and why that occurs. And that's one of the other things that Webb is going to really help us with, you know, learning about what's going on with galaxies at you know, redshifts of four, five, eight, and above. We'd like to understand more about black holes. So we know now that most galaxies have supermassive black holes and powerful active galactic nuclei in the centers of them, but we don't really know all that much about them yet, in part for a couple of reasons. Partly because oftentimes the accretion disk surrounding the black hole is so bright and powerful that it outshines the galaxy around it. And these so-called quasars are super interesting, but very difficult to study because the central part is so bright, it's hard to really study the galaxy itself around it. We need to find some way to mash out the light from the central part of it in order to study the surrounding area. We're hoping we should be able to do that with good knowledge of what the web so-called point spread function looks like. We're also very dusty. We just can't see through the dust to see what's happening in those central regions. Because Webb's an infrared telescope, it should be able to help cut through that dust and tell us what's happening in those very central parts of these galaxies. We'd like to learn what planets around other stars are like. We'd like to know, you know what they're made of, what their air is like, how similar or different they might be to the planets that we're familiar with in our own solar system. There's a couple different ways we can do this. I mentioned coronography earlier, the idea that you, you know, put your thumb over the bright part of the object so you can see the faint thing. We can do that actually in some degree from the ground. Here's an example from Keck, for instance, showing you what you get looking at a super bright star where you know, you've mashed out the central part. When you do that, you can see these faint dots of planets moving around it in real time if you take this data over the course of many days and many weeks, and in some cases, even years. And we're hoping to be able to do things like that with JWST as well, but at vastly larger contrasts than we're generally able to achieve from the ground. Spectroscopy also helps tell us about the atmospheres of exoplanets. When we're looking at a star, if that star has any planets, there's you know, some reasonable chance for a number of stars, at least, like the planets are going to actually pass in front of the star, as seen from our point of view, and block out some of the light from it for a while. It's pretty small. This teeny tiny little black dot that you might not even be able to see on your screen is what it would look like if the Earth passed in front of the sun. It doesn't block a lot of light, but especially for the more massive planets, things like Jupiter, it's enough that you can detect it. And it doesn't block light the same at all wavelengths. If that planet has an atmosphere, light passes through that atmosphere and it'll be blocked in certain ways, depending on you know, what elements are you know, in that atmosphere. So you can actually make a measurement of how much light is blocked as a function of wavelength. And you can see things like water vapor popping up in the atmosphere, methane, carbon dioxide, et cetera. You can measure these things that are in the atmospheres of exoplanets and say something about what their planets are like. We don't think necessarily offhand that we'll find something that's exactly like Earth, so a spectrum like we're looking at here. But we're getting ever closer, and it's going to be exciting to see exactly what kinds of planetary atmospheres we do find. Closer to home, we want to re-examine our own solar system's planets, things like Jupiter. Now, we've been able to take lots of you know, wonderful images of Jupiter for a while, but we'd like to be able to follow that up with this infrared spectroscopy to try and now learn things about you know, what's the actual composition of Jupiter's clouds. Now, what are Saturn's rings you know, made of in fine detail? Can we get you now some kind of a measurement of their you know, chemical composition? We can look at the moons in the solar system as well. We'd like to try and understand a bit more exactly what the organic chemistry is that's going on in you know, some of the moons of Jupiter. You know, for instance, if you're looking at you know, something like Titan, if you're looking at Europa, what kinds of water features? If you're looking at Io and all of the you know, volcanic activity that's going on on that, you know, that's going to be great to have infrared cameras for and infrared spectroscopy to be able to understand where that volcanic activity is occurring. 
So really throughout the entirety of the universe from the earliest times, the nearest solar systems, we're looking forward to the kinds of things that Webb can tell us. Probably only got about five minutes or so left. So I'd like to wrap up quickly by talking about where JWST is now and what you can look forward to over the course of uh, the next few you know, weeks and months. As you know, we're super excited that JWST after 30 years or so of development lifted off on December 25th at the end of last year. And this was particularly exciting because I managed to be part of the MUI launch day team. So in the Mission Control Center at Space Telescope during that launch. And that was definitely a memorable place to be. Uh, launch was super exciting. There's a large number of people who've worked for very many years to make this happen. And having web off the earth and on its way to its final home at last is absolutely fantastic. It gave us one final present on its way. You may have seen this picture uh, published in various places as well. The fact that we got a final departing picture of Webb saying goodbye was a you know, very wonderful surprise. Uh, when Webb finally separated from you now the last stage of the fairing that was launched from on the Ariane rocket, you can see the Webb telescope itself here moving away. The telescope itself is kind of tipped up and away from you. So you're just looking at you now the very back side of it, the spacecraft part. You can see the uh, this is the um, solar array down here, which right before it moved out of frame, we got to see the solar array deploy, which is a fantastic confirmation that the deployment was starting off on the right foot. So that this is a wonderful thing for uh, us to have been able to have for our final view of webs that moved out in the solar system. There's a tool online, which if you're not familiar with, you might want to check out. This is the Where is Web page operated by NASA, which is a live updating thing telling you about where Web is any given time. It updated throughout the early stages of Web all the way out to L2. The most recent news of which is that our second mid-course correction burn that put us into our final orbit around L2 happened successfully yesterday. So I can say happily that as of yesterday, Web is at L2. And the mission itself has been going really incredibly wonderfully so far in terms of you now the number of successful pieces of the deployment that have happened now on schedule to date. Next thing that needs to happen is we need to phase up all of those mirror segments to make them work together as one single larger telescope. So all of these 18 segments when we start are gonna be producing images of a star in you know, lots of different locations in the field. It's not terribly helpful. So you need to, over the course of a couple months or so, very finely tune each of these mirrors, tip them, tilt them, make them work together as a single thing. That's gonna be taking the next couple of months or so. The overall timeline, we've finished the deployment. We are now here in the timeline. Uh, we're undergoing cooling. The telescope itself is gradually cooling off to operating temperature. Telescope commissioning is going on for the next two or three months or so. And then we get into the part that is particularly exciting for me, where the instrument teams get to go to work. We get to turn on our instruments and start looking at uh, various things in the universe to try to calibrate them. We have to calibrate now exactly what the light looks like. We have to now figure out how to map the distortions of all the light paths. We have to figure out how to put things on uh, absolute photometric reference frames so we can tell you, you now exactly how much power you're getting in various different places, et cetera. That's gonna take another couple months or so. But the end of that time, so looking around so end of June, beginning of July of this summer, we get into science. And that's the bit that all of us are most looking forward to and that we hope we'll be able to continue for many years. So I mentioned earlier a couple of things that we're excited with doing with the telescope now from the very distant universe to very nearby. But the one I'd like to leave you with is the unknown. One of the things that we've discovered from Hubble and all the other telescopes we've operated is that often from a legacy point of view, the thing that's most interesting with a given telescope are the questions we never even thought to ask until we used it to look. And in that case, it's going to be Webb's journey into the unknown, the things that we don't even know that we're going to learn that's perhaps the most exciting. Thanks to my children and their movie habits, I always now hear that song in Elsa's voice, which makes for at least a you know, memorable earworm, thinking of you know, all of the new things that we'll learn from Webb's voyage into the unknown. But I believe I'm about out of time. I'll stop there. But I'll say that you know, I'm certainly looking forward to exploring the universe with Webb in the coming years. You can look forward to you know, the first science data coming out this summer. 
And if you want to keep in touch with now real lifetime updates of now what goes on over the course of the next few weeks and months, you can always follow the official NASA blog on the web here. And that's a great way to stay up to date with exactly what the latest is in commissioning. I will end there and show one final slide advertising for you know, your own excellent uh, series that you're running through ASX about some of the upcoming talks that you can look forward to as well. So thank you. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Lev, for presenting an informative talk. Really appreciate your uh, appreciate time. Um, so we'll ha uh, we have around five to 10 minutes for any, yeah, yeah, we have five to 10 minutes for any Q, uh, question and questions. So you can either type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, so there is a question from Josh. Um, do you think the James Webb Space Telescope will revolutionize our understanding of the universe similar to Hubble? Personally, I would imagine so in the sense that there's you know, so many new ways that we'll be able to look at the universe with JWST that you know, we just haven't even thought of yet. For Hubble, arguably one of the most interesting things that it did was to just look at something that looked blank. The Hubble Deep Field was originally obtained by somebody saying, what if we looked at just a blank part of the sky? What would we see? So they picked an uninteresting part of the sky with pretty much nothing that you could see and just stared for a really long time. And they discovered that if you look very deep, you see you know, millions of galaxies just filling the entire space and going out to vast redshifts. And that was science that you know, wasn't even part of the you know, original plan with Hubble. It's just something that we found when we you know, came up with new ways to use the telescope. And honestly, I think we're going to be able to you know, see similar kinds of things with JWST as well and answer questions that we don't even know that we have yet. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, we have one more question. So um, what is the pink shot on the sun side below the five um, sun shields? The pink thing. Okay, I can show the screen again, hopefully to you know, try to see what it is that you're looking at. So, Just screen. There we go. So I think this was the image that you were looking at here. This is a not entirely accurate image here in this particular illustration. In this case, you know, what this is meant to be down here, that looks like that's probably the palette itself that contained the original sun shields. Depending on which illustration of web you look at, it shows things in slightly different ways. But um, from this view here, the underside of the sun shield is what you're seeing here. And this is the you know, UPS or the you know, universal palette structure that forms the you know, basis of the structure that originally held those sun shields in a rolled up configuration. Uh, we have one more question. So Nicole is asking, do we know what the first official image will be after calibration? Um, and they can imagine the team would want something wow worthy for the public to see. Right. So certainly there's been a lot of uh, interest and effort put into figuring out exactly what those first few public images they're released are going to be. The idea is that uh, we're going to want to showcase the power of Hubble of uh, JWST and the new observations it can make. Exactly what those are hasn't been announced, and we should know as soon as NASA puts out you know, those very first images sometime towards the end of June. Um, so Josh asks, will the data collected by James Webb be publicly available? Yes, so this will follow the same model as we used for Hubble in the past where the majority of people who use JWST will have a small time of you know, a proprietary period in which to use the data for their own science programs, typically about a year or so. But after the end of that time, all data from JWST will be in the public archive. So anybody can use the data to you know, do their own science that they think of doing you know, with the data that exists on disk, yes. Uh, yeah. So Helen asked, will it be used to um, better map out the Milky Way? Yeah, so there's a couple of programs planning on using JWST to particularly look at you know, galaxies surrounding the Milky Way, things where you want to be able to you now look through the Milky Way's disk, for instance, to know what's going on on the far side of the Milky Way, 
to understand more about what's going on with you now the satellites that are orbiting around uh, our own galaxy as well. We've learned a lot about our galaxy lately, particularly from the Gaia satellite too. Now Gaia has provided a lot of information about now particularly the proper motions of stars. This is something that you really can't measure with many other telescopes, exactly how they're moving on the sky. Those proper motion components have given us information about how you know, streams of stars are moving around our galaxy. And I think JWST will be able to really help provide context for a number of those observations as well by telling us about what kinds of stars you get in various different uh, galaxies and globular clusters surrounding our own. Uh, Adweet asks, what are the implications of James Webb um, for the astrobiology? Will it aid? the detection of exoplanets and possible life in the universe? All right, well, of course, that's uh, kind of a million dollar question of can we find life around some other planet in the universe? And JWST is a big step towards getting us there, but I'm not gonna claim that we actually find you know, life around another planet with JWST. That's probably a step too far, but it gets us a whole lot closer than we've been able to get before. In the sense, we haven't been able to study you know, what the atmospheres of planets around other stars are before. We haven't been able to learn about what the molecular chemistry is of those atmospheres in the way that we'd like. And JWST is gonna get us a long way of the way there. It's gonna tell us a lot about the atmospheres of you know, particularly giant planets surrounding other stars. So Jupiters and other such massive things. If we want to really start getting down to you know, the biochemistry of things like Earths around other stars, I think JWST is gonna be tantalizingly close and get us almost there, but we might even be looking for you know, what the next mission is to try to you know, get just as far as we'd like, but we're getting there. Uh, why didn't they make the diameter of James Webb's orbit around L2 much smaller so it, always, it is always in the Earth's shadow? Right, so that would be one way of doing it without requiring you know, as much of a sun shield. You'd still need to block out the heat from the Earth, even if you know, you're always sitting in the Earth's shadow and blocking out the sun. But one of the main reasons why is you don't actually want to block out the sun entirely. JWST needs power and it gets its power predominantly from a solar array. And now that solar array needs to have constant sun illumination. So if we ever actually passed into the Earth's shadow, there would be a problem because it would shut down now a lot of our power supply. Uh, so we're carefully in an orbit around L2 so that we're always maintaining that solar power now on the hot side of the telescope and then keeping the cold side of the telescope shaded in the way from uh, the sun. Um, I personally had a question. So mm -hmm. what implication would um, James Webb make for like, um, what are the steps after this um, for a project? Like what would be the next project like James Webb and how would it um, implicate um, around the instruments used and the technologies used for the next um, project? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of discussion of that right now, actually. So uh, one of the things that you know, makes astronomy fairly unique is every 10 years or so, then you know, we undertake a so-called decadal review of what some of the biggest topics are in astronomy and you know, what the biggest questions are we need to answer, what some of the next facilities are that we need to build, kind of looking out with a you know, 10, 20, even 30 years or more timeline to what needs to happen next. There's been a lot of work that's gone on into trying to figure out what comes after web and a number of mission concepts that people have sketched out for things. Now, now there's a couple of names like now Louvois and Habex and various other missions that people have thought about that should be able to pick up where web leaves off in now 30 years or so. But exactly which one of those missions is going to be you now the thing that actually goes to you know, development and gets built, we don't know. But there's been a lot of discussion of that recently. And this most recent decadal report came out you know, within the last couple of months or so. And it has some guidelines for how we might want to think about those questions going forward. So I'd hope within the next few years or so, we'll probably be able to get a bit more clarity on exactly what the parameters of such a next space mission might look like. And it's certainly going to learn from a lot of the experience that we have you know, with Hubble early on and more recently now with JWST as we look to the next few years as well. Thanks so much. Um, so does anyone have any last many pressing questions? Um, yep, sounds like we are good to end. Okay, 
So thank you so much everyone for attending our talk. Um, if you enjoyed um, our Star Talks and um, so consider joining us for our annual symposium. You can find information from more about more information from this link. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe, for your uh, valuable time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation.